Hey Internet, I'm Chaz. And I'm Dan. Welcome to Wine and Series Business episode 183. We're back with Byron again. He's got such a huge lineup and he's so much fun to talk to that we just couldn't narrow it down to a single show when we were out here. We're like, let's do two shows. They're really different wines. We've been trying to get out here for quite some time. Um, so, so we'll do two different ones, two very different styles of wine. Uh, but we forgot to do this at the beginning of the last show. So why don't you tell us a little bit about what got you into making wine and really what you're trying to do with it today. Yeah, that's a good point. Okay, well, um, it really kind of interesting. And I started here in Oregon, and though I grew up in California. Uh, spent a lot of my primary career in California. Uh, but in the early 80s, was tasting wines on the weekends with friends uh, while I was going to uh, Oregon State getting you know, pursuing a different degree. Just came across these Pinot Noirs that stuck in my mind over the years. I mean, I can still taste these wines today. Well, do you remember a revelation wine? Yeah, uh, oh, it's always a good question. Yeah, it's kind of interesting. Um, it's, it's, I'm not going to mention the brand because I'll tell you one right now. This brand, Fair the enough. only reason I want, don't want to mention the brand is because this, this wine really struck me and it, it was really great. The, the, the producer is not great in Forbes, to be honest. Okay, it's, fair it's enough. It's just one that's kind of, uh, you know, developed into something different. But, and there were a lot, there were a lot of good wines, honestly. But there was one Revelation wine where, I, you know, that, that sticks in my mind. It clicked, right? Uh, it clicked. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, I pursued a different career over many years and, uh, you know, followed wine the whole time. It just, that from that initial seed in, in Oregon, I continued to make yeah. this. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, explore different wines uh, throughout my career, and at some point, my interest in wine overtook my interest in my other career. So I decided to go back to school nice. in California, get my viticultural wine making degree, intern for a piano or producer there in California. I okay. uh, planted a small vineyard on Hell Mountain. That was all part of my education when after I graduated uh, from that second degree. I thought, yes, this is indeed what I want to do when I grow up. So uh, we made a decision to, to come back to Oregon after thinking about some other possibilities. Uh, found the vineyard that became Linda Sills Vineyard. Uh, and then started, uh, you know, researching that. Uh, spent a lot of time just dialing that out perfectly, and then putting together the plan for the next ten years. Which, as you'll see today, includes our rose style wines, along with the Pinot Noirs we tasted uh, last week, the you know the, the various whites, the Bordeaux style wines, which go back to the origin of what I did in California, the dessert wine. So um, that's the history of it. And, and the whole concept here is really about for the Southern Arts label about exploring. Other vineyards, other ABAs, other varietals is distinct from our state. And I, I thought that was an interesting point that maybe we didn't touch on fully in the last show is that Luminous Hills, you're really focusing on one place. That's right. right. And then the, the Seven of Hearts is just you're you're really seeing what's out there. Exactly. You're really trying to focus in on like key things that you really find interesting. Exactly, because you can't live by Pinot Noir alone. And Luminous Hills Vineyard is Pinot Noir, and I love it, and it's a distinct site. Uh, but there's no qualitative difference between Luminous Hills and Seven of Hearts because we have strong relationships with all of our growers mm -hmm. in terms of you know producing the best quality fruit from the different blocks that we source from. So the, the concept there is about doing things beyond them, so it's exploring other vineyards, other ABAs, other products. I mean, a lot of kin of from all the different ABAs we work with. But here, today, we're exploring uh, one of the set of wines, the Rums uh, wines, and the shut down, you know, right. sub-label of Seven of Hearts, which is really inspired by, all my wines are inspired by great wines I love from the old world, um, okay. like in this case, the Rum now. And what's this uh, first one? So the first one, we're doing a set of three from the 2011 vintage. The first one is a, a, a Grenache. And Grenache is, uh, you know, is, a, is a truly noble grape and often doesn't get enough attention as a, a single varietal, even though okay. it is often a single varietal, but it never shows up on the label in the old world because it might be a, from a region. Of course, the wines of the, the, one of my favorite regions in the heart of the Chateau Neuf de Pop region, which is the name of the label here, Chateau Neuf, which is a nod to that. Okay. Those yeah. wines can have many different grape products, and as many as 13, of course. Right. Quite usually nice. fewer, depending on what the grower grows, what the source, what they have an affinity for. Mm -hmm. But my favorite blends always tend to be dominated by these three varietals. Um, the Grenache, and we'll see them all together in, in the blend, but here, this really is, is a nod to just this great noble varietal. Uh, I have a really simplistic way of describing Grenache, and, and forgive me for that, but it, I call it Pinot with white pepper because a great Grenache has got a lot of the elegance, and finesse, and texture, silkiness of a Pinot Noir, but it's got this distinct peppery note that comes through on, on the best sites. And nice. I think that's what you're seeing here. And these, all three of these wines are from vineyards right along the banks of, of the Columbia River on the Washington side. It's the Columbia Valley, okay. Washington, ABA. Uh, the, this vineyard is uh, the Avery Vineyard, 29-year-old uh, Grenache, which, you know, no last 
last night. Oh, by your camp standards, but it's old for a new world. Pretty yeah. crazy old for, for for the new world. But more importantly, uh, they're all grown right along the Banks River, which have a lot of qualities and very reminiscent of, of, for example, Rhone Valley, where you have uh, the heat that these varietals need, especially the Grenache and Morbet. Mm -hmm. The moderating influence of the river, uh, right. cooler temperatures at night, retain more structure in the city. Again, these are more old world style. These are not big bombs. They're they're about you know having some finesse and elegance and texture. And so you know you've got those components. You've got the gravelly sandy soil there, which I credit with all these you know Provence all spice notes that you get, high rocks qualities, and then of course even the winds that come up the gorge are like mistral winds of the Rhone Valley. And you get a very beneficial help out in terms of the you know the, the health of the vines. Right. Cooling effects, keeping them from getting too hot. And, and you know the airflow and minimizing disease. Oh yeah, minimizing yeah. disease. Yeah. Yeah, that's a nice thing to keep in mind. So the spice you're talking about is all over the very yeah. here. Yeah. Yeah. And and there's a lot of complexity to it as well, right? Like the white pepper he's talking about is definitely there, but there's just like touch, yeah, like touches of nutmeg, touches of herbal notes, and I think oh, like this yeah. nice. Yeah, this nice raspberry flavor kind of underneath it all. I think a lot of Grenaches, um, even, even ones that, that we've had, even ones that we like, uh, can really be getting into the, the purple syrup kind of yeah, kind drink. of wine. And and this is this is not, right? This has a mm -hmm. has a light character to it right out of the gate. And one of the real keys to this is the is the oak balance. This is all neutral French oak. You know? Okay. Not not a lick of new oak. Um, mm -hmm. you can avoid one year old barrels on this because it's just so delicate. Um, you know, in terms of the, the profile, you don't want any of that, um, you know, that the Grenache quality, the, the texture, the spice, the, um, to, to get lost. Man, this is really enjoyable. We, were, we, we, we always go through pre taste of stuff, you know, like figure out what we want to do for the show. And this is one that stuck out at me because I should say, when I see Grenache, or this New World Grenache, bottled separately by itself, I haven't had a lot of terribly good experiences with it. It's usually been sort of simple, maybe like on the lower end, wine for them, and just something to, to fill the fill in the gaps between their other like bigger wines. And this one is just really, really nice. Like there's obviously a lot of love that was put into this wine as far as the quality level is concerned, because the, the fruit is delicious, the structure is delicious, and there's like a bunch of minerality in this wine that is uh, pr pr pretty awesome. Like the chalkiness and the tannin is just fantastic. Well, thank you. I do yeah. love this wine. I always say I have an intimate relationship with my barrels, and it's just the best spending time with them, get to know each of them, and how they play together. And these ones play together nicely. I think. I would say this is a, a substantial Grenache without being overstated. Yeah, right? like it's not, it's not big. It's not gloppy. Like this is light and delicate. Has really, really nice, yeah, yeah. crisp, yeah. But uh, just the, the way the acidity and the tannins on the finish is just awesome. What is, this, what is the price point on this one? So this is, um, it's not really inexpensive. It's $29 bottle retail. Mm -hmm. right. The reason, it, what you'll see is these first two are single varietals. They're really small production wines. I basically mm -hmm. selected four barrels for these, for these wines, 98 cases each. So that's that's a function of low volume. The, mm -hmm. the GSM that we're going to have, which is a blend of the Grenache, the Mauvet, and the Syrah, is $25. Because they're, you know, I've got the advantages of volume. And, and right. For, and, 50 case production. Nice. And uh, a low alcohol offering, I think, across the board for these, right? Typically, we see these varietals come in 14, somewhere in there. They tend to be on 15% like, Grenache. Grenache. That's not weird That's at all. That's not weird yeah. at all. Yeah, what, what is the alcohol? Yeah, this is 13 and a half. The, the Morbet is, is 12 and a half, and yeah. the GSM is uh, 13 and a fourth. Yeah, so uh, and I think being so low like that, the, the freshness of the, of the wine really comes through. And like you were saying, Christmas, it's just, yeah. Well really, done. Yeah. A cool take on Grenache. And I really recommend any of you that's, that are watching this that are curious, you know, to see what, what lighter style Grenache can do uh, in the valley. This is, a, this is a great way to get, or, well, Columbia Valley. Yeah, it's a great way to get exposed to it. So thank you. I'll keep making it. Yeah. Thank, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Uh, that's wine, killer. Wine yeah. number you two. You got it. I can't All right. Yeah, I suppose that's all. I'll do the rinse first. So you, you focus on Pinot, and you focus on... Rhone, and you focus a little bit on Bordeaux as well. Like, uh, yeah, um, so well, why, 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 I mean, yeah, it, you don't see that very often in a land value, which is a lot of times why I tell people to come to Seven of Hearts and taste here because you're getting to try so many cool wines. But uh, 
What about what about those particular regions inspired you to make the wine from them? Well, those are the wines I love. I mean, you know, we did come here to make Pinot Noir, and that's a big focus of what we did. That's what I did primarily for the first several years, uh, cool climate Riles, Pinot Noir, and Chardonnay. Mm -hmm. But the plan all along was to do a broader range of wines because those are the things I love. But introducing each one gradually. And, you know, fundamentally what it comes down to is that, you know, as much as I love Pinot Noir, you can't live by Pinot Noir alone, right? Right. Um, I mean, what do we drink? We drink, you know, Rome style wines, we drink, you know, Italian wines. The, the variety of wines is part of the fun of it, right? It, it's exactly yeah, right. To... And so that's what I'm really trying to do. But I'm trying to do it at a scale where the overall production is now going to exceed 5,000 cases. Uh, okay. So that, that there, you can have hands on every barrel and Right, you're right. Really yeah, so they're totally I think efficient. there's, you know, there's a perception maybe with all these different wines that they're just all sort of, you know, half-hearted tents. That's not the case. There's nothing here we don't put out that I wouldn't really like to drink myself or nice. share with people that I would oh, hope so. Yeah. All right, all right. So this is the Mouvedre. Yes. Okay. So um, if if the Grenache is is a little Pinot-like in some qualities, this is definitely the anti-Pinot. Uh, this is the Mouvedre. It's 100% more good, four barrel selection. Um, this is the other world altogether. I mean, classic yeah. varietal characteristics, um, gamey, leathery, you know, totally agree brooding, angry. Um, <laughs> it's got, you know, the tobacco uh, component, the, the dark fruit, black mm -hmm. pepper. Um, but you have to think about this in the context of food, you know, whereas mm -hmm. the, the Grenache has got a range that's probably comparable to. Pinot Noirs in terms of, and maybe a little bit broader in terms of because the pepper notes and some right. bigger foods. Here you're, you're talking about something that, you know, throw some game meat at it, some venison, or, mm -hmm. um, you know, elk or boar or you know, stinky cheese. Something big. Yeah, something, something big. big. Yeah. Uh, but it's, it's, a, it's I, I, I love the varietal, it's so distinctive. Mm -hmm. This is a great nose, yeah, like the gamey and tobacco descriptors, like I'm 100% on board with. And I'm getting some great earthy funk out of this too, like dry red earth, and not like not like the Dundee Hills, right? This isn't like earthy Pinot Noir at all, it's kind of its own distinct, you know, kind of earthy character. More primordial earth. Yeah, definitely. The, I mean, the, only, the, the, the closest thing I can compare it to is stuff I've smelled from Red Mountain, although it's not exactly like that, it's kind of in that direction. I think. It's got a better memory than I do. It's been a while since we were at the Red Mountain. I was there. The oh, time. you were there recently, okay. You know, this is a, this is a varietal that does require a fair bit of heat, so it's grown for us out in Hell's Gate, in the uh, Washington side of Columbia. Hell's Gate. Uh, uh, Hell's Gate. Well, yeah. good name. Good name. Interesting that there's two choices for the name of the vineyard. Um, we have a choice of Hell's Gate or Sugar Roof. Hell's Gate. Badass for this point here. Yeah, take Hell's Gate. That's good. <laughs> but although Sugar Loaf is certainly fun. <laughs> Well, it's pretty thick. Well, it's a functional little geo geologic formation there in the vineyard. Okay. Um, it's, it's, it's an interesting wine in the sense that the nose is definitely a lot of the leathery, earthy components. The tobacco comes through. The palate has like a dark fruit with a, a sort of a tart edge, but the, 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 the leathery, peppery components come, in, come through for me on the finish. And uh, again, because of being a little, sort of a lower alcohol vendor, I'm totally used to like big 14.5, whatever. Um, the fruit has a really, uh, like a, just a nice linearity. You don't ever lose it, right? And it's, uh, it's really nice. Yeah. The persistence is really, there we go. That's really tough. Yeah. Um, so I'm getting like these, these earthy flavors and the kind of tannins settle into the gums and teeth. But on the center of the palate, it's like when you bite into those perfectly ripe, dark red cherries, you know, when they're right in the right spot where they've still got some acidity, where the juice is still really clean and not too sweet, and that just hangs out in the middle of the palate. And still, while, I, while I'm talking, so this is like seconds after on the finish, you're getting this like clean, delicious fruit lingering on the palate while the structure settles into the sides of the mouth. Some minerality going on there too. I'm, I'm so excited about this. Like, this is really delicious. It's really good. Do you think we should make this our new state? Right. Yeah. Is this from the Oregon side? Like no, 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 okay. Well, we can make a wash to this new state for <laughs> Maybe, I, I, I'm... But definitely something you should probably do more of. This is, this is killing. Well, no, without a doubt, the, the best domestic event I've ever had, for 
Oh, yeah. thank you. But this, this is this is small reduction. It's still double what we did last year. So uh, we're inching up. We're careful with these unusual. Two barrels, four barrels, four barrels, four barrels. Yeah. Wow. I'll just leave Dan's casing up there because, like, that was he's you're you're on fire tonight. Um, but just just the 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 way this finishes just it's so it has a. Fantastic linearity and taper, like it just. There's no gaps. There's no. Uh, I struggle to say full integration at this point. There's. It's not fully integrated because there is some, some really good and strong acidity, some tans, but everything has a really nice feel. It's really well balanced together. Like the yeah, parts, parts of a song that are just right there together. Um, really nice. So thank you. Well, I think you know what I'm, one of my goals with this was to actually have a, a more of it that had a little bit of. Uh, I think you, yeah, I think you nailed it. The, yeah. acid, the acidity, especially. Like one thing I've really appreciated about Seven Hearts label and the wines is that they're always a really they can, they can come off a strong acidity, but it's never overwhelming or the texture is never off. And this is uh, it's right there with with uh, what I know from you in the past. So, cheers. Well, thank you. Yeah. Cheers indeed. All right, quick rinse right here. So you were talking a little bit earlier about the GSM blend and that almost all or all of your Syrah went into it this year. Yeah, the last drop. So this was a little bit unexpected. This is the third vintage to making this um, blend, a Grenache Syrah Morbet blend. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's it's always intended to be different every year. We call it just simply call it GSM. It's gonna have those three varietals in it. A bottle after some of my favorite round wines, which are dominated by those three varietals. Right. Uh, the previous two vintages were dominated by Grenache. That made the most compelling blend. This this time, I fully expected that going into the blending trials, but was you know cut off guard that the Syrah really was the heart of this wine, nice. and so it is dominated by Syrah. It's got 35 percent Grenache, from an elegant fruit, you know, white pepper. The Syrah is 52 percent of the blend, more wow. you know the earth, the meat, the, the blue fruit in the middle, and just 13 percent more of it, but still enough to deliver those those you know gamey leathery mm -hmm. tobacco notes at the back end of the wine. Um, but this is really where the magic happens. I get the Grenache, Syrah, and Morbid to make this blend. Uh, you know, I love the, but I can never resist making the varietals by themselves, and they're equally compelling in, in certain scenarios, or food situations. But here you, you really are, that's, this is historical about these varietals, they just have, you know, especially in a warmer site, you know, they, they draw upon each other, they complete each other. Um, so, yeah, that's why why we do this. Um, awesome. Was 2011 a cool year in the gorge too? It was relatively cool, but the thing about that area is partly because of the river, and partly because the, the the fact that it's it's a much warmer region in general. You don't see the variations that you do in the Willamette hmm. Valley, and you know, and so in the Willamette Valley, that's really what makes for the really the differences that, in my opinion. The different uh, Pinot Noirs, for example, the different Chardonnays, right? The Pinot Gris over the years, the, the vintage really has a big stamp on. Here, it definitely has an impact, but it's more about how the varietals respond to the vintage in more subtle ways and how they come together in different pieces. That's why, whereas the Grenache may have made the more compelling blend, as a major component the last year, this year it was the Syrah. You know, the Syrah right. just stood out. So, I mean, the truth is, I mean, I would have liked to have made a Syrah by itself this year, but it re it, I really need off its wine, so I sacrificed the Syrah to, to make you know enough of this that's, that's great to have that flexibility, I think, too, right? Yeah, you know, and it's you know, I, it's not like we feel like we have to make the set of yeah. wines everywhere. We'll make the best set of wines we can, and so it's uh, it's like we talked about before. It's sort of iter iterative process going back and forth between the single varietals and the blend to really optimize the blend and optimize that expression of the varietal by itself. Nice. The nose here is dominated by just. Wonderful dark pepper and blue fruit for me. That's the Syrah time. Yeah, the Syrah is talking big time. Um, the first taste through, I was, I was, uh, I didn't get so much of that, but now it's like really sticking out to me. I'm getting some dry earthy scents on this as well. Do you do whole cluster on any of these? No, I don't. Okay. I do a lot of whole cluster and Pinot Noir. I don't, haven't done any or don't do any um, any of the Rhone varietals or the Bordeaux varietals. Okay. Blue fruit and pepper, just a little bit of rich, like a rich edge to it, the earthiness, and it smells really good. 
it is all made of these firmware. Yeah, that blue film really, really jumps right on your palate right away, right in the front of the tongue, I think. Yeah, so I, even though even though the Syrah isn't there, mm -hmm. <laughs> you get the yeah. it from what yeah. you tasted there, it's subtracted from the other, so oh, there's the Syrah. It's yeah, sort, of sort of a play between like ripe blueberries and then like tart blackberries kind of going on in the palate. Yeah. A little bit of like tobacco-y notes going on in the finish. Um, again, really, really nice acidity and tannins that don't overwhelm the palate and have a really nice texture. Um, and yeah, delicious overall. I, mean. I really like how the structural elements kind of stick to the side and, and they give this nice frame to the wine, but the fruit really sits on the tongue where you can really kind of appreciate it and, and enjoy the fruit flavors, you know, breathe. There's a, there's a long expression on the palate. Well, maybe not like a ton of evolution, the, the flavor that's left over in the center of the tongue lasts for good 10 seconds, 10, 15 seconds, which is really nice to have. And then being, being lower alcohol, like I could see, I hate to use the word like, oh, pair this with food, but this would be killer food wine. Totally. Well, like, uh, yeah. I, want, I want to eat some steak with this. This is Yeah, this is yeah. definitely, I call this a grilled meat wine for sure. Yes, awesome. But, uh, yeah, I do like to think of all these wines in the context of food, really. I mean, yeah. we're, we're, just, we're tasting them in isolation here, but, you know, food is the key that unlocks a, a good wine. Totally. And I think that that's the case with all these. And it is fortunate this vintage afforded a little bit you know, more modest alcohols. And, mm -hmm. um, we try and always keep that dialed back, but you know, we work with the vintage when it gives us. And, and this, that that's one thing I appreciate about your wines too, is that you, you've had some high alcohol wines. I and, and you work exactly, you work with what you've got, and you make the best wine you can. And sometimes, I, I've had some of your uh, your high alcohol whites, and they're awesome. They're really good. And like, they don't burn you up, right? Yeah, exactly. Like, where, is this 15 something on the label? 15, 18 degree, 15 Yeah, degree. But, but it's, it's not, it's but not had, like a, a blanket of alcohol like you get sometimes. It's, I've had 13 so. fives that taste hotter. Well, right. exactly. That's the right. whole point. Yeah. It's all about balance. So, totally. you know, I mean, yeah. generally speaking, I prefer wines in the you know, 12 and a half to 13 and a half percent range. But the truth is, is that if it's going to make a lesser wine, to make a lower alcohol wine, then there's always ways to do it. Um, you know, then, then that's not the objective. The objective is to make the, the most compelling wine, the, the best expression, the, the most complete wine. And so, if it has to be higher alcohol to do that, then, then we'll do that. Awesome. So, when you're talking about Rome being uh, inspiration for these wines, what's something that you think sets wines uh, from the gorge apart from Rome, for better or worse? Like, are there any characteristics that you think uh, are consistent? Yeah, well, first of all, I'll just to clarify, I would never say that any of these wines would be mistaken for Rome and wine or that we're trying to taste like the Rhone Valley. It's just those no. are the inspirations for these sure. just like Pinots are inspired by great wines of Burgundy, but they're, they're of their own place. And so the old world techniques that are applied here, you know, many of these fermentation, whole cluster fermentation on a high percentage of those, you know, the minimal manipulation, the you know the delicate use of oak is really about capturing, you know, this, the place. And that's the old world concept. So if you apply old world concepts to the new world, you get wines that taste more like the new world. Right. Or my <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah, Sometimes. So, <laughs> that, so that's really the goal here. But so the, the different, I mean, you have to taste, I mean, obviously you have to taste the wines to make that call yourself because everybody oh, yeah. is called, it's different. But, you know, there is, you know, there's a, we have hundreds of years of history of saying, what is a round taste wine, you know, from mm -hmm. Coco Tea or Hermitage or, right. you know, uh, Chateau Neuf de Pop or Bandol. You know, we're in the young stage of these wines, but, um, you know, this, just 29 years for this vineyard here, and you're starting to see distinct quality comes out every year that I would not mistake for any other wine from any other place, whether it's, you know, Rhone Valley or California, or even farther parts inland or up the river in, in Washington. That's so, exciting. Yeah, definitely. That's really, it's got to be really exciting to watch from your standpoint. It is fun. You know, so we talked about last week about Luminous Hills and each year it's developing ancient, but that's the great thing about working with all these other vineyards. We have that same perspective on, on these as they develop and grow. Fortunately for me, a lot of them planted earlier than, than ours, so I get to see you know, something that's much older. We'll give another oh, awesome. plug, plug for the, the winery here. They're in downtown Carleton, a great place to visit, and one of the things that, you know, why I like to visit, why we're so excited to do the show, is because the conversation we've been having over these last two episodes are pretty much exactly how it plays out when we come here to taste. 
Uh, Byron loves to talk about the wines. He's so involved with every single bottle that he knows a lot about them and is happy to share that information with somebody's, somebody that's here and loves wine and wants to talk about it. And that's not an experience you could have in every tasting room in the Valley. Um, so it always makes it a really enjoyable place to visit. And I really appreciate that you work in your own tasting room and that you're willing to you know, engage with people that you've never met before that way because it really, it's good for the whole, whole community, right? It's really good. Well, I enjoy it. Yeah, it's honestly, it's one of the best part of my jobs. My job. <laughs> cool. My other job is being blending and farming and all that. And I love yeah. those too. But no, we, it's, it's really comes down to the experience we have with our customers. And, I enjoy that as much as anything else. It's, it's, yeah, it, I totally appreciate it as well because w whenever you go tasting in the valley, like I, tr I, I, I've tried to guide a lot of people to Seven Hearts because just like Dan said, you get, you get, you come in here and you get Byron here. You could, you're like, okay, I'm gonna make a, a 15, 20 minute stop, and this will turn into an hour long stop sometimes, depending on how involved you are in the wine. Come by if you're short on time. Exactly. <laughs> One, because there's a lot of interesting wine here to try. If you want to come and just drink Pinot, well, yeah, you could do that anywhere. But there is like, you've got Bordeaux varietals, Rhone varietals, and a whole, whole blend, like even uh, a port and dessert wine. So I, I, I've always loved tasting here and uh, try to guide your people. And they have the, the chocolate, which is never a bad thing. Honest uh, chocolate, yeah. Yeah, so you come here, hit, hit it like a midday stop, sort of later towards the day, you're going to get some awesome wine and chocolate, which is always two thumbs up in my book, but thanks Byron for Thank doing the show with us. Always yeah. enjoy the visit, and this was particularly fun. Yeah, yeah. and <laughs> one more question, Frank. Ah, uh, okay, so tell me about all the Grenaches that you've had, uh, both domestically and uh -huh. from the old world, um, mm -hmm. and if you really want to spill your guts at the top, tell me about the more you've had, because that's even more, less common. And Grenache, of course, being a very widely planted variety, right. even though it's not so common in the new world and not easy to find on a particular label. Yeah, by itself, it's right. It's always a lot of times blended. Usually in yeah. France, it might be Spain, Garnacha, and whatnot. But oh, yes. of course, remember Mauvet is also goes by the name Monastrel in Spain, right? Mm -hmm. And also um, Taro in various places. Uh, a lot of new world producers have adopted that name. Okay. Uh, but those two varietals in particular, I'm interested in you know, what people have tasted, if you like them. Um, if they stood out for you as single varietals, because I do think that these, I mean, the blend is, again, one of the magic happens, but yeah. these varietals are noble, noble varietals on their all oh, on their own. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I'd like to hear about that. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Yeah. And uh, My pleasure. We'll see you next week. Bye, guys. Thank you.